Securities offered through Cetera Advisor Networks, LLC, member FINRA SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through CWM, LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor. Cetera Advisor Networks, LLC, is under separate ownership from any other named entity. Carson Partners, a division of CWM, LLC, is a nationwide partnership of advisors. This is The Way to Wealth. With host Scott Ford, a jujitsu fighting, woodworking, beekeeping entrepreneur who is also the managing director, partner, and wealth advisor of Carson Wealth. Financial freedom is the goal, and clarity and simplicity is how we'll get there. Let's get to it. This is Way to Wealth. Hello, and welcome back to the Way to Wealth podcast, where we're all about making money simple freeing you to focus on what's most important in your life now, where you can truly live today. Excited today. Excited to have a guest uh, and friend, colleague Andrew Howe from Utah, tax attorney uh, that I have experience with, super knowledgeable. And the other thing that I like about Andrew is he speaks English, not just legalese. So that's refreshing. So lots to, to talk about today. And when you think about the way to wealth, you all know that there's a foundation to it. The W in way to wealth, what's your foundation? Then there's six bricks in that foundation. Well, two of those six bricks are estate planning and asset protection. That's why I like to bring experts in like Andrew. And that's exactly what we're going to chat about today is estate planning and really focus in on asset protection. So without further ado, welcome Andrew to the way to wealth podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm really excited, Scott. Yeah. And your background's awesome. Uh, we talked about that before I hit the record button. Uh, a little jealous, I, I must say, uh, but uh, <laughs> beautiful uh, scenery and a great place to do a podcast there in Montana. So let's, let's start with, um, Andrew, just how you got in the business. Like what, why estate planning? That seems exciting, I know, for most of us, but, but why estate planning and asset protection? Well, uh, it's definitely it, not most people would think that's very exciting. You know, when, when people go to law school, they want to come out of it being the next Perry Mason. I think I think very few people say I'm going to go through three years of the hell of law school and come out and move people's money from one column to the next. Right. Which is what a tax attorney basically does. But I loved it. I my uh, my dad and grandfather uh, were both attorneys. Um, and my grandfather, uh, who was a Harvard Law grad, practiced in estate planning, doing what I do. And um, it's very active in my life. And, and uh, it, my, my mom's an only child. And, and then it's just me and my sister. So we had this really small family. And my grandpa was very old school. And, you know, you're not going to sit home during the summer and, and, you know, play with your friends. You're going to come down and work at my office. So, you know, 11 or 12 years old, I was down at his office, you know, doing the gopher stuff. And, but he was also very, very active in, in allowing me to participate at any level that I wanted. And he had this very large client, um, very, he was, he's deceased now, but he was one of our billionaires in Utah. He owned a company called Sinclair Oil. And, and he also owned some hotels around the country. And he, he came in for a meeting with my grandpa and I knew who this guy was. I was probably 13, 14 at the time. And of course, my grandpa was this behemoth in my life. And my grandpa said, would you like to come in and just listen to this meeting? And, and he asked, he asked um, this gentleman, he said, Earl, are you okay with, with my grandson coming in? He's like, sure. So I'm walking into the room. I'm, my, grand, my grandpa looks at me and he says, you're going to sit there and shut up, not say anything, but just listen to us. And, and I sat there and watched these two guys have this conversation and, and I, you know, at the time I didn't get it that my grandpa was practicing law. He's talking about this new asset that he was buying. And, you know, the asset was four miles of oceanfront in Santa Barbara, California. So I, you know, it's this huge asset and, you know, there wasn't a talk about really how much it was worth. There wasn't a talk about taxes. I mean, the very first question that my grandpa asked him was, you know, what's your long-term goal with this property? And I thought that was really cool because it wasn't an adversarial thing, right? It weren't fighting against another lawyer. You weren't at each other's necks. It wasn't, you know, contentious and stressful. And I thought you can really practice law this way. So I knew I wanted to go that way into law school. So unlike everybody who was doing, you know, moot court and law review, which are good things if you're wanting to try to get into a litigation background, I did the international taxation and the business courses and the estate planning courses and um, so I knew I was, I was going to do this, uh, or I wanted to do it. And I, I got out of law school, started with a large firm in Salt Lake, was there for a few years, 
joined another large firm. And then in 2013, my partner, David York, and I left and started your Cowell and Guyman, and it's been fun. We ha- we started with three lawyers at the time and four office staff, and we've grown to uh, 18 lawyers now and like 34 office staff, and built our own building. And so it's been fun. It's kind of it's fun to feel like a lawyer and an entrepreneur where you're running a business too. Yeah, that's cool. And uh, yes, it is, and and that's unusual for the most part, at least from my experience. And certainly, um, that's my background is just being an entrepreneur and business owner that happens to be in wealth management, so I can definitely relate. I want to start with a basic question for you. It may not be as uh, basic to everyone listening. So I want to start here and just talk about, because I'm, I'm mentioning two things is the foundation, estate planning and asset protection are two of the six foundational bricks in our process. How would you describe the difference if someone's listening into this? How would you describe the difference between asset protection and estate planning? Yeah, it's a fabulous question. And I get it all the time. And the way I explain it is, is sort of my elevator pitch. If somebody were to ask me what I do, what I'm going to respond is I'm an estate attorney. It's a horrible elevator pitch. I know I've got to find a different one, but that's basically what I would say. Now, when people hear that, they're going to go and, and think, okay, wills and trusts and all of this planning that everybody ought to do in this anticipation of one event that's going to occur to all of us, which is death, Right. And so many people just choose to not do it. I think only 30% of the population ever does any kind of estate planning. And that always baffles me because, you know, there's always a plan for your estate. It's just whether you choose to exercise something different. And I'm somewhat of a control freak in my life. And I like to control the things that I can and then fight with the rest of the world as to why I can't control everything. So I like the idea of being able to come in and take control of the decisions that I can make. So estate planning is usually how I describe myself, but Estate planning, I think, encompasses all of what we're talking about here. It's not just what happens with your estate at death, which, of course, is the wills and the trusts and all that kind of stuff. But what are you doing with your estate while you're still alive? Right? How is that estate that you're acquiring and, and working your life and sweat and toil and blood to, to achieve? Well, how is it being managed in the most tax efficient manner? And that, of course, brings in tax planning and business structuring and even charitable giving. And then how do we make sure that this estate we're working hard to create is protected from this litigious society? Um, we do live in a very, very litigious, litigious country, and most, of the, most people will go their entire lives without getting involved in a lawsuit. But then you start adding these risk factors into your life. Maybe you're a professional in some way. Um, then you, you know, maybe you own some rental properties. Well, that alone is a risk factor. Um, so all of these things come into play that make people who have those higher risk factors need more asset protection planning. So again, I think that asset protection planning is a subcategory of how you are protecting your estate in this overall category of estate planning. So, so looking at that, looking at estate planning, and you made it, you know, a comment like thirty percent was the number I think you used of people have an actual estate plan, which is I don't know if everyone knows that or, or how often you know that is stated, but that's pretty alarming. Well, let me make, and let me make it clear. That doesn't mean it's a good estate plan. Um, it could mean, you know, a lot of it is, um, I think the military is really good at encouraging, you know, soldiers and so forth to get their planning done. But, but when they do that, they go to the JAG office and they get a simple will, they get a power of attorney. I mean, they get the basics, um, you know, legal zoom rocket lawyer, some of these online services for, for, you know, kind of do it yourself. Um, I don't have, I'm not going to badmouth those places. I think if people take the time and do something, that's great, but you're not going to get a product that is specifically tailored to your family. And so there's very, very few estate plans that I think are done well. We did this, uh, we wrote an article for Trust in the States magazine a few years ago, and it was called Grats versus Gratitude. Um, As we talked before, Scott, one of my big passions in estate planning is passing on legacies through families not creating trust fund babies, trust afarians, as we call them in our book, Entrusted. But we wrote this book, or we wrote this article for Trust in the States magazine, and and we looked at the clients and how long it had been since they had actually reviewed their estate planning, even if they have one. And on average, it had been 18 years. When When I work with clients, I make my clients think about their estate planning every year. Um, you say that a whole lot can't change in a year. Yeah, go tell somebody that in January of 2020. 
right? Uh, that nothing's going to change in a year. So a lot changes in a year. So without question, estate planning is something that people will put off. And I understand why. I mean, who wants to think about death and taxes and talk to a blood sucking Grim Reaper lawyer like me about how to deal with it? And life gets in the way, right? We're all you know working hard and making money and taking care of our families and going to kids' sports events and all of these things that take up our time. And yeah, I need to get to that estate planning at some point. Yeah, and then you mentioned 18 years on average is when the estate planning is reviewed. So right, 30% have it. And then of that 30, what's done well? And then once you have it, because it's one thing to get it done, uh, then what? And then if you're reviewing it on average 18 years, you can see where this is a challenge. And it just makes me think, and you're kind of speaking to it a little bit, but like what, what is conventional planning in, in, in the estate planning world? What's conventional wisdom there versus and, and how that doesn't work. I think you gave some examples of how it doesn't work. How do you see the counter to conventional estate planning and how have you seen that work well? It works well and sounds stupid, but when the planning is done. Now, let me make, let me make sure that's clear. I don't really think estate planning is ever done. It's, it's up to date for any given time, but tomorrow it could very well need to change, right? Family dynamics shift all the time. I say all the time that, that one of the busiest days of the year for me is the Monday after Thanksgiving. And it's because families have been crammed together for four straight days and they'll hate each other and want to cut each other out of their estate planning. So the, an up-to-date estate plan is what, what, what I love to see. And what that means is, you know, I think everybody ought to have a will. I think everybody ought to have a trust. And a lot of my colleagues will not agree with that. You know, some of my colleagues say that if your estate is so low, do you really need a trust? Um, yeah, because otherwise you could very well go through probate and probate opens your entire, you know, basically finances up to the public because it's a court process. And so you get privacy. So a good up-to-date estate plan, wills, trusts, power of attorney documents, both for financial and healthcare decision-making and a medical directive is sort of the basic package of an estate plan. And then like we've talked before, it ought to be maintained and up-to-date so that, you know, who you've chosen as guardians for your children or backup trustees or healthcare decision makers. Those things change all of the time, making sure that those are up to speed. And then probably the biggest slam I have on estate plans that are in place, you know, people have paid a lot of money to their attorney to get these documents prepared. They've signed them and so forth is that they don't put assets into the trust, right? Trust funding horribly important part of estate planning. And again, that's something that can change tomorrow. You buy a new asset, you forget to put it into your trust. And now all of the planning that we've done for is for not because you still have to go through probate being that that asset was in your name. So a well-planned will, trust, estate, and power of attorney documents that's up-to-date and well-funded, that's when it works amazing. And what it also does, I mentioned the article that we wrote, um, families that have stuff planned out and even, even in families where a child might get less than another child for some reason, but everybody is clear about what's going to happen, those families are on average 86% likely to be in harmony the next year, meaning they're still getting along. Where families that don't do any planning, it drops down to like in the 60 percentile, where you know, only 60% of the time they're getting along. I think that's a big goal in your estate plan is to make sure your family's still getting along after something happens to you. But that's such a big stack because I don't care who you talk to. That's really what they ultimately want. We're not, you know, not wanting to be a burden to our family, leaving them better, uh, you know, by what we've done, not worse off. And so then how do you do that? Well, you know, we, I, I read a book years ago. Uh, I think it was Jim, Jim Hughes that talked about, um, family wealth. And it was like shirt sleeve to shirt sleeve in three generations. And it's like, well, the, the summation of that from my takeaway is one thing. It's called communication. So why does it make to generation three? Well, it's because communication from gen one to gen two, the parents and the kids, that wasn't properly done while we were alive. This, it never really made it to, to gen three and beyond. Well, that's it. It's a generational thing. Again, you're now getting into the part where I'm passionate about estate planning as we know it, wills, trusts, and how they're even currently drafted today by attorneys. I, I do do things a lot differently than a lot of my colleagues do, and I have some good reasons for it. But it all was born with our grandparents, the, the, the great generation. And they lived through this time 
that is different than any time we've ever lived through, right? The Great Depression, people weren't eating, okay? The Great Recession, we were all unhappy and COVID, God, we were stuck in our house, but we know where our next meal is coming from. And my grandfather had this saying that I just love, which is that money isn't everything, but it sure quiets the nerves, right? So you had these people standing in soup lines, waiting to not knowing how they were going to feed their family as soon as they come out of the Great Depression and they start getting assets. That was their comfort blanket, right? It kept them feeling safe. I can feed my family. And therefore, financial assets are what became important. And most estate plans right now do basically one thing, bundle up the money and pass it on to the next generation with trying to do the best tax planning so the most dollars get passed on to that next generation. And there's very little discussion about the impact that money is going to actually make. And so you take it through the next generation, you know, the baby boomers who arguably li- you know, live through the most affluent time in American history. Well, their, their priorities changed. And you have the 60s where they're, they're having you know, revolution and change and, and so forth where our generation is going, wait a minute, can't we have both? I mean, we still think that these, you know, these financial assets are important. They're tools that we get to use to do what we want in life and what we need to live our life the way we want to live it. But can't we also give our kids purpose so they're not, you know, as Warren Buffett would say, give a kid, you know, so much they can do anything, but not so much they can do nothing. And so this is a very, very common thing. And like, as I mentioned, our book Entrusted, the very first principle that we think families that do this well, what we call entrusted families are able to do is identify who they are and what they believe. That's the first step. Because otherwise, a family comes to me, I'm going to put a, an estate plan for them that bundles their money and gives it to their kids. But I want to know who they are because it might not be their goal. It might be that they want to have a charitable arm, a gener- a, some sort of generosity kind of component to their family planning. And so the, the point here being is that families deciding kind of what their core values are and me knowing that then gives me the opportunity to draft an estate plan that is different than what the Ford family's estate plan looks like, different than what the, the Howell family's estate plan looks like. Because even though I know we have a lot of things in common, hunting, fishing, so forth. Yeah. I know we think differently about a lot of things. And so I think a, an estate plan really needs to be specifically tailored to that family. But how are we going to build it? And it's a difficult discussion. It's not a comfortable discussion. A lot of people have that, like you mentioned, communication issue where family members don't talk about it. Um, and you know that is a generational thing as well. right? The greatest generation, we're silent about money. Don't talk about it. Don't tell anybody what we have. Again, it's totally different thinking and mindsets, and we're just, we're just seeing it more and more as a demand by clients saying, I don't want my neighbor's estate plan, this cookie cutter boilerplate plan that some lawyer just printed off of the computer and changed my name on. I want something that really identifies who I am, who my family is, and the legacy that we're trying to leave. Yeah, no, that's good. And, and, and you know, look, we've done that. And um Right. We have the, the friend in common. And I think he uses the word statement of purpose. And no matter what you call it, what I will say. No, is- he uses he uses family constitution. Look, oh. Let's all get it out. And he's now he's told me I could talk about it because I'm loving him to death. He's one of my best friends, Garrett Gunderson. Great guy. Yes. But he calls it a family constitution. And that's totally fine. He wrote his book. What would the Rockefellers do? And I think it's a great book. Um, he actually quotes our book Entrusted about four times. And I always give him grief that he plagiarized our book. But the, the family constitution is a great way to think about it. I, I do think about it a little differently. When I, when I hear family constitution, I think United States constitution. It, that's what comes into my mind. And the United States constitution is the what, right? It's we're going to have three branches of government, checks and balances and all of these things. The way I think about this, if you were to use kind of those terms, is more the family declaration of independence, right? That was the why, right? We're starting this country break off from England, all people are created equal, all that kind of stuff. And that's what I like a family to do is is come up with that declaration of independence. The risk that people really run into here is being too dictatorial, right? Saying, look, this is what my wife and I believe, and this is what you have to do to be successful in life and make money. It's not a great idea because what you're doing is you're taking preferences and you're raising them to principles. Like I I would bet almost all my clients, if not all, think that education is a very important thing for their children. And um, I've even had some clients go so far as saying my kids don't get anything unless they've graduated from college. Now, 
I know what they're going for there, which is an honorable intention. It's the kids should get to college. It's going to make them more profitable uh, or be able to get a better job so that they can be self-sufficient and self-reliant on their own. The principle there is self-reliance, right? Getting your child to be self-reliant. The preference is education, but education isn't always the way to get there. I'm, I'm sure you have, Scott, many clients that never graduated from college. I have many clients that never graduated from college that are worth a heck of a lot more money than I am. So the point here is, okay, if self-reliance is the principle, because I think that's going to hold true now, I also think it's going to hold true 100 years from now. So the idea is, 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 is being careful of raising those, those preferences for what you've done in your life and how you've become successful and making your children follow that same path. They're not going to do it. They're going to find their own path. But if the, pre- if the principle of self-reliance is there and you set up a system whereby they have the opportunity set up by you to become self-reliant, it, it's a completely different way to think about it. Yeah, that is so good. That is so good. And let me give you a real story around that, Andrew. Not only do I have clients who have never graduated college, I didn't. So at 19, I had a small football scholarship at Li- uh, Liberty University. My dad was a minister and uh, wanted me to go there and had a small ride, but they didn't have any money. Mom and dad literally never had any money. And like, this is part of my backstory of that left an indelible mark in me. Like at a young age, I saw the stress that it created in family. They were good people, but they never really had the freedom. He would make promises. We're going to do this. And if we move here, we're going to get a pool and all these things. And, you know, wonderful. None of it ever happened. And it's because they didn't understand money. So like, that was my journey at at an early age. Uh, So then when the whole, uh, potential going to Liberty University, two things, two things happened. One, it wasn't a full ride and mom and dad didn't have any money. Two, they, they sent me this video of like the rules and what you had to wear, which was this tie. And like, there was a curfew, I think. I don't even remember what it was, but like that sealed it for me. I'm like, Oh, I don't think I'm going. (laughs) So he wasn't super excited about it, but like it was one of the best decisions I've ever made. Now I'm a voracious reader. I'm a, I'm, um, so curious and constantly learning and growing. And I will to the day I die. I just took a different path. Now that's not for everyone. So academia is wonderful for those that it fits. It's just not for everyone. So there's a great example of if you would have forced me down that path, who knows where I would have ended up. And so now, you know, I'm fulfilling my life purpose and I'm, I'm being me authentically and I can benefit people by being in that space, by growing personally, being authentic, being genuine and real, and then helping others in their area of, uh, of genius as well. And so for me in the trust and estate planning world and asset protection, but specifically estate planning, that legacy piece you know, we wrote a purpose in there. And ironically, in our trust document, our statement of purpose is about health, wealth, wisdom, and happiness. So that our board of directors knows if the children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, like here's what we want to leave behind. Well, that's what this podcast is. It's the way to wealth, but the way to wealth is one piece of health, wealth, wisdom, and happiness. So that's just how to tie it all together. Here, Here's the question I have. For well, you. yeah. And, and, yeah. and what's so great about I love I, the statement of purpose because that's the term kind of that I use. And I'm wondering if that's if, if you and I had talked about that. But, you know, statement of purposes now because of the different medias that are out there can be so dynamic. Um, even Garrett's, for example, his statement of purpose, because I told him mine was 30 pages long. As soon as I told my, him mine was 30 pages, his had to be 75 pages. Right. Yeah. But I, again, love I love him to death. But um his is really dynamic. I think he's done a great job with it. He has links to his videos from YouTube. Um, I mean, just really a rich content so that like in, in his case, his board of directors, his board of trustees, or like in my case, my board of trustees, like you said, they can read that statement of purpose. They can say, this is what Andrew and Candace were hopeful for the, the results these assets would create and how each child chooses to get there. That's wonderful. But now that board can manage the trust with their their discretion in a much less static way than, okay, when you're 25, we're going to dump a third of the assets on you and hope you don't blow it, right? It's just a a completely different way to think about it. Plus, I I think a lot of us are trying to create multi-generational impacts, not just necessarily wealth, but I care just as much about what my grandkids are going to make out of themselves as I do my kids. 
and my great grandkids and my great great grandkids and I might not ever know them. And how can I let them know, you know, what it was that I did right and what I did wrong when I'm six feet under. And, and that statement of purpose is always going to be there. It's going to be governing the trust because how I lead trust to kids is never outright ever. It stays in trust for their entire lifetime to protect it from, you know, being lost to creditors and a whole bunch of different reasons, but also to be governed by the statement of purpose. So I know we, I think you wanted to talk about asset protection planning and we got off topic talking about legacy, but this is, this is where the two books we've written just go to our whole entrusted process, our rivets game, really getting to the idea of who you are, what you believe and what you're really trying to accomplish. Look, this ties it all together. And then I'm going to, then I'm going to jump to simplify for those listening. I want to say this, and that is human life value is what we're talking about. Like how do you transfer? It's money is energy. Money's a tool. And this is how it ties together with the weight of wealth in my mind is yes, you can pass that to the next generation. Yes, you can pass that meaning money, which is a tool to the next generation. So how would you, so I have a couple questions here. One is some strategies for people with let's say 500,000 investable assets ish, 500,000 to let's say 2 million of investable assets. Okay. What? Sh- so I'm listening, I'm listening in and I have 700,000 investable assets. I have a net worth of 1.5 to $2 million. Okay. This is all great stuff, Andrew and Scott. Sounds sense, make, makes sense to me, but it's like, my gosh, I'm overwhelmed by thinking a statement of purpose and all these other things. Here I am, 700,000, 1.5 million to 2 million net worth. What are some, how do we simplify this? What are some things I could and should be thinking about regarding estate planning and asset protection? Right, it's, it's an elephant, right? How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. And so we take it in stages. And so for a client like that, um, I mean, obviously all of their basic stuff that I don't do, uh, like on the insurance side, Right. From protection of risk, insurance is always your first line of defense. Good car insurance, good homeowners, an umbrella policy, all of these different kinds of things are, are fabulous protection for clients in a, in a level like that. Um, they're not having to pay an attorney tons of money to do crazy protection planning because asset protection planning is this game. And I don't mean to minimize its importance by calling it a game. It's a really important game that you should play, but there's hundreds of different ways to play it from some very simple things that you can do, like making sure your insurance is all in line or like in my case, my wife's a stay at home mom. I'm a lawyer. I have much more liability risk than she does. And so we have separate revocable trusts. And and then you kind of play this game of where you get to the point with the client where they're, they're happy, right? We call it the pillow test. They can put their head on their pillow at night and fall fast asleep knowing things are protected but not so much planning that I have just dramatically complicated their life or made it so they don't enjoy their assets any longer. Right now we're doing, because some of these tax law changes that are coming, some of my ultra high net worth clients are really worried about where taxes are going. I think they probably should be, but uh, we're doing some trusts uh, offshore. Um, One of our favorite locales to do some really aggressive asset protection planning is Nevis. And so we're starting five trusts in Nevis for a client for various reasons but he's paying us a lot of money to do it. And it's really complicated planning. You're dealing with a foreign nation and you know people can say what they want about the United States. We're still the most stable economy in the world. If our economy goes down, the rest of the world has major problems. So I don't like taking my assets and moving them offshore, but this guy's willing to, to give that, that give up that level of control and enjoyment he has over his assets for the protection that he's getting. I'm not willing to do that. I'm betting you aren't. I'm betting most clients are. So what you try to do is to find that structure where they can still control and enjoy the assets. But if you're ever involved in a lawsuit, they could look at the person who's suing them and in as many legitimate ways, be able to tell them pound sand, you know, spend all the time and money you want coming after me. And I'm going to make it as difficult for you as possible. I'm going to fight you the whole way. But even if you're successful, there's no guarantee you're going to get anything. I don't own anything, right? The home's in my wife's trust or it's in an LLC or it's in Nevis. Right. And that's the that that's why everybody's plan needs to be specifically tailored. Right. You might have a five hundred thousand or a one point five million dollar estate, which would sort of say, hey, maybe you could just kind of rest with insurance. But there might be other issues. You have a lawsuit that you think might come around. 
And because of that, we need to do more aggressive planning. So it's this give and take, I think. And, and what I always tell clients in this, in this genre, I'm, I'm the gas in the relationship between the client, right? I'm telling them, go, 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 go. These are all of the things that you can do to get as protected as possible. Because in my mind, I'm thinking if I have to help them with this process, I want to be able to go to that lawsuit settlement negotiation, right? 95% of lawsuits are settled here in the United States. And I want to be able to throw as many legitimate legal arguments at the person coming after my client. But at the end of the day, after I form an LLC for somebody, the client has to run it. And, and, and keeping up with corporate compliance and you know, making sure that company bank accounts are, are accounted for correctly and transfers are all occurring, look, it can get pretty complicated. And so that's the other give and take here is where does the client become the brakes? I'm the gas. The client says, no, Andrew, that's great to hear all of that and what we can do. But I don't want that, that level of complication in my life. So it, it really is this, this dance that you have to do in determining what are the risk factors in a client's life and what aren't. Now, in a client like yours, or the, the first example, 500000 to you know, 2 million, 1.5 million, without question, a basic estate plan, wills, trust, power of attorney documents, medical directives, those are, are, are critical. Um, and then whether or not they need additional asset protection planning really depends upon those risk factors that might be in their life. We had talked about this. One of the things that I like to do on Way to Wealth is we've created one page tools for each thing that we do. So it's basically when you look at the whole process, we start with the foundation of you know tax reduction plan, uh, estate plan and legacy uh, planning, asset protection planning, insurance maximization planning, interest rate credit planning and cash flow and control, which is what the whole game's about. And then once we have that foundation, then we'll look at buckets of money of three different buckets of the now bucket, which is the savings bucket, the income bucket, the growth bucket, and all in this order. And we have one page tools for each one of these because several reasons. One, they're thinking exercises because at the end of the day, what's missing in all of this in my mind is education because that whole cat, this whole game is about cash flow and control, and control is a piece of it. Well, the reason we don't feel in control, just like going through the pandemic, is we don't understand what's really going on. So we create these tools to bring simplicity and use it as a thinking exercise so that people are thinking, they're talking, they're writing, they're visually seeing because people learn differently. So on that note, I'm going to give you access to maybe give us some examples to show us what some of this might look like because some are visual learners, learners. So those not sure. listening, but also, you know, visually looking, you know, if you could give us some examples of what you're talking about from basic to just advanced planning, both estate planning and asset protection, if you could just give us some visual examples, I think that would be helpful as well, Andrew. Just kind of something I put together knowing some of the questions that you had had for today you know, what would I think about doing for a typical client? And, and let me kind of explain the client profile here. Um, it's a professional or entrepreneur owning their own business, their own practice, medical practice, dental practice, their own company, whatever it might be. And maybe the spouse is also a professional in some way, doctor, whatever it might be, maybe not. And when I, when I begin people on this kind of discussion of asset protection, not only explaining is it this game, there's many different ways to play the game. What I also really like people to do is try to compartmentalize their thinking. Now, that is really hard because our entire lives, I don't know about you, Scott, but you're taught to think outside of the box, right? Um, and that's great, you know, the, the, the creative thinking. But I'm dealing with two adversaries here that love it when you try to think outside of the box because it blows our strategy apart. The adversaries here for me are the IRS, and I want to make sure that anything we do gets the tax benefit we were trying to get. And then the other adversary, of course, is everybody else, right? All of the bad actors that want to come in and take the assets that you've worked hard to create. And again, both of those, those bad actors, the IRS and, or I shouldn't say bad, the IRS is a bad actor, but the IRS or bad actors, they love to say that your structure has not been given any respect 
You didn't compartmentalize your thinking, meaning you bought your groceries out of the company account rather than first taking a distribution or a salary or whatever it might be. So again, keep that in mind, compartmentalize your thinking. And I like that to, to get even deeper, really compartmentalize, uh, compartmentalize your life in terms of, of your professional life versus your personal life. The risk in your life and for most people is in their professional side of things, right? Yeah, I'm not the greatest driver, but if I am going to lose all of my assets because of a lawsuit, it is going to be because of me representing a client, committing malpractice, and then suing me for millions of dollars because I you know, didn't create a state tax benefit for them. That is much more my risk. So really compartmentalize your thinking. And I always you know, put in this corny wall of protection to really make you think that my professional life is different than my personal life. And over here, this is where we're generating the money, providing services, you know, selling goods, all of those kind of things. Um, and we're doing it because most likely those sources of income are, are active earned income subject to the highest tax dollar that's out there. And like running it through an S corporation so that you pay yourself a reasonable salary and take a distribution of profit. But everything that is made over here eventually comes over here. And like in this case, if I were to label this, let's say this is my trust Right. And this is my wife's trust, Candace. Yeah. And, and Andrew, now, I'll just interject for those listening and not visually. This would be good to pull up and watch this piece, this section. If you're not able to do that, basically what what Andrew's showing is this proposed structure. When you're looking at it face on, it's the professional on the left hand side with your corporations, organizations, your professional, which is your higher risk. There's a line and then on the right side is the less risk, which is personal. So now he's talking about setting up a trust for you and your spouse on this personal side. So yeah, go ahead, Andrew. Just to kind of weave in what we were talking about before, the trusts, um, one of their goals is to avoid probate. So my interest in anything, LLCs and so forth are held by my trust as opposed to my personal name. So that's just kind of to bring that into focus and in what we were talking about before. But then what we're trying to do on this right-hand side is really bring that level of protection, maybe even that sweet spot, meaning where we've done enough planning that you're sleeping well at night, but still have control and enjoyment over your assets. Like in my case, I kind of use myself as an example. Uh, we own the building that our practice is, is you know, located in. Um, I also have some investment properties and then you know, cash and life insurance and you know, after tax investments, brokerage accounts and those kind of things. Now, what I'm going for here is to try to deal with the three risks um, in asset protection. And most people think about one of the risks here, but I think there's really three. When I'm doing this kind of planning for a client, I am trying to protect that client from an asset that could harm them. Okay? They might own something that they'd have no idea could actually hurt them, but how do we protect that? I also want to make sure that the client's assets are protected from each other and then finally, I want to make sure that the assets are protected from the client. So let's, let's take this example. Um, something happens. I get sued for some reason, malpractice, or I injure somebody in a car accident. When they come after me, I'm going to say, look, I don't have anything. And they're going to say, why not? And, and by the way, this is another thing that I think is poorly done in asset protection, at least with a lot of colleagues that I see around the country. They try to convince their clients that there is a way to stay anonymous or there's privacy or they can keep their assets from being discovered. A bunch of hogwash. It, it, I will find out about everything. Everything comes out. There is no such thing as privacy in this world that we live in. The way I like my clients to think about asset protection planning is almost the exact opposite. Total transparency. Being able to sit down at the settlement negotiation table and say, here is my legal structure. You try to break through it. That's so much more powerful than, like, oh, I hope that creditor doesn't find out about this property I have in Texas. They're going to find out about it. Everything comes out. So when I sit down at the settlement negotiation table, if I have this structure in place, another important thing to understand about asset protection planning, the best time to do it is when you have absolutely no reason to do it. If I get in a car accident and injure somebody and try to take all of my cash and put it in an LLC tomorrow, the court's going to say that's fraudulent. You are trying to get out of paying a rightful creditor. But if I put all of this cash into an LLC yesterday 
and get in a car accident today, I could never have known I was going to have a creditor. So again, I come to the settlement negotiation table and I say, you want all of my assets? Guess what? I don't own them any longer. Well, before this car accident ever occurred, I set up an LLC, let's say in Wyoming. That LLC in turn owns an LLC in Utah. That's where I live. Um, and it owns that Utah LLC is where I own all of my cash. Okay. Now, that's going to give me some much greater protection. But what I'm also doing is dealing with that first risk. I mentioned that I own commercial property. I also own some real estate investments. Those are assets that bring more risk to the table than any other kind of investment that could be made. If I go spend half a million dollars and invest in general electric stock on the market, well, I have made half a million dollar investment. I could lose my half a million dollar investment if GE goes bankrupt and my stock is worthless. But that's the limit of my risk. When I buy a piece of real estate, rental property, vacation property, commercial property, and I pay $500,000 for it, that's not the limit of my risk. LeBron James comes onto my property, slips and falls and injures himself. He's suing me for $100 million a year because he can't play basketball any longer. He does not care. I only paid $500,000 for that property. So by putting a piece of property into an LLC, well, now the owner of that property is the LLC. LeBron James slips and falls on that LLC's property. The LLC might get sued for half, you know, for $100, billion or $100 million a year, but the only asset that LLC owns is that property with $500,000 of equity in it. So I've cooled my, li- my investment risk down to my liability risk and great way to do in terms of owning property. Now, the second thing I, I mentioned risk-wise was protecting assets from each other. The old adage, don't hold all of your eggs in one basket, right? You never want five rental properties and all of your cash inside one LLC because now if I fall on one of those properties, I get to go after the equity of that property. The four other properties that is also owned by the LLC and all the cash that that the LLC owns. And I keep coming back to cash because I think people do not do a very good job of protecting their cash. And cash is key. I can't tell you how many times I'll talk with a client who has an operating company on this left-hand side with tons and tons of cash inside of it. And it doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, obviously, leaving your company what you need to run, cover payroll and all of those expenses, but every dollar above that, take it out because there's no benefit. I mean, you're going to pay tax on that money, whether you leave it in an S corporation or you take it out. Plus, as we talked about before, this is where all of your liability risk resides. Take it out, put it somewhere else. Because if I come after you as a creditor and you own a rental property in Ohio, great. That's better than you not having anything. I'm a lawyer. I don't want to be a landlord. Give me your cash. I can do anything I want with that. So cash is king. So again, compartmentalizing your risk. Another thing that goes along with that in terms of how many LLCs that you should have is where is the real estate actually located? If you own a property in Colorado, you ought to do a Colorado LLC to own that property, a property in Illinois, an Illinois LLC to own that property. There was a bad court case that occurred down in Florida a few years ago. I don't need to go into the details, but it basically has made us all say, if you're going to own a property in a given state, start the LLC that's going to own that property in the same state. This third risk, which is I think what people traditionally think of when they think of asset protection planning, is protecting your hard work, your assets from the outside world. So this is what we were coming back to before. I get sued for some reason and somebody says, Andrew, give me your assets. I'm going to look back at them and I'm going to say, I'm sorry, I don't have any assets other than this 50% ownership that I have in this LLC in Wyoming that I formed with my wife. That's what my big asset is. The cash is inside this LLC. It was been there well before the car accident ever occurred and you can't go after that asset. And that's actually a winning argument, right? They, okay. And, and it makes sense, right? If I, if I were to be a, an owner of General Electric, let's say I own 10,000 shares of stock, small owner, but I'm still an owner. If I got sued personally, the person suing me, if they win in court, cannot pick up the phone, call General Electric, tell GE to sell one of their jet turbines to pay their owner's debt. It's crazy talk, but that's basically what somebody would be asking me. Give me something that, Andrew, you don't actually own. 
right? The cash that's inside that LLC. Now, the problem with the GE example is nobody's going to really do that. They're going to say, Andrew, give us what you do own, which is the 50% interest in the company. Now, when they say that to me, I'm going to look back and say, well, you have to understand what I really own here. I don't own 50% of General Electric. This holding company isn't a publicly traded company. It's a privately held partnership. I formed this partnership with my wife. We signed an operating agreement well before the car accident ever occurred. And inside our operating agreement, there's a provision that says we cannot transfer our ownership interest unless we both unanimously agree. And that's been routinely upheld in the courts as a valid business interest in a closely held company. Again, this isn't publicly traded like GE, where we want everybody in the world to buy stock and we all become rich because our stock price rises. My wife and I formed this company because we wanted to do business with each other. We didn't want to do business with anybody else. And the courts have said that is a valid interest in a privately held company. So the person suing me says, Andrew, give us what you do own, your 50% interest in the company. I get to look back at him and say, look, I've got to tell you a couple of things. First of all, I'm a nice guy. Um, but for me to give you that ownership, you're going to have to get consent from my wife. And good luck, because I haven't been able to get her to agree to anything since she said I do 19 years ago. So it's one of these ways where I now am in a, in a situation where I can't get the I can't give that creditor the asset because I don't own it. I can't give them what I do own because I contractually gave away the right to give them that asset. Well, what can that creditor get from me? Well, if they decide to continue on with this lawsuit, and that's a big if, again, 95% of these things will settle, probably a higher percentage chance that this is all in place. But if the creditor decides to take me all the way through years of litigation and hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees out of their pocket and they win in court, well, what can they get from me now? Well, what the court will give them in terms of this LLC structure is this, this thing called a charging order. And a charging order is an order from the court to the LLC. And it tells the LLC that I got sued and I lost and I now have this creditor hanging over my head. And if the LLC were to ever distribute something to me as an owner, well, instead, it has to go through the charging order to my creditor, right? My creditor has taken my revenue stream from the LLC, which sounds really scary, except for the fact that, again, this is a partnership and partnership taxation is flexible. It says one partner can be paid everything and one partner can get nothing. So now my wife and I, who aren't just the, you know, we're not just the owners or members of the company, we're also the managers of the company we'll say, okay, we'll remember that. If we ever make a distribution to Andrew, it'll go to his creditor instead. And now magically all of the distributions, like they already do, don't tell her I said this, go to my wife. Okay. And now I am left in this position where I still own the interest in the company. My creditor holds a charging order that if I ever get paid, they're going to get something. I'm not going to ever get paid. So now we go to our goal, right, of protection. Look, if I go to the settlement negotiation table with a structure like this and say, here, try to break through it, the person suing me is not going to be very happy. And they're going to be much more willing to settle for something far less. And what loss of control and enjoyment have I, have I had? Again, that's the downside to this. Like my clients in Nevis losing a lot of control and enjoyment. I've lost none. My wife and I are still the managers of all of these companies. If we want to sell the commercial space or a rental property or do a 1031 exchange, assuming Biden still allows us to do that. Well, I and my wife can do that as managers of the LLC. So we're still in control. And then in terms of enjoyment, well, what happens if I want to take something out of it, right? My wife and I decide we're going to take the family to uh, Bora Bora, decompress from this whole COVID debacle. Well, there's $20,000 inside my cash LLC that I need. Well, what I have is that cash LLC that I'm the manager of, distribute it to the owner, the holding company, and then the holding company distributes it to us and we go on our trip to Bora Bora. So that's the, the loss of enjoyment, which is you have to follow those steps. And people sometimes don't like that. But with how automated banking can be now, you can have all of these things linked up where you can transfer from one LLC's account to the other LLC's account. It's not that big of a deal. So again, a lot of protection, 
um, no loss of control and really slight loss of enjoyment to the assets. So that's just kind of something that I think is a great, a great level of asset protection planning for people. Um, it usually gets most people to that sweet spot where they feel very, very well protected. This stuff has been challenged in court. It works. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, then, you, then you start talking about the layers above this. Um, then it starts getting more technical with domestic asset protection trusts and even international asset protection trusts. But if somebody gets to this level, they're going to be more protected than 95% of the population out there. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a lot. I just threw a semester's worth of information at you. It's good though. And, and visuals for sure on this section of our chat will be helpful to see. So definitely uh, watch the visual. We'll put a link to this in the show notes so that you can pull it up uh, and be able to see the actual document that Andrew's sharing. What questions should they be asking um, an estate planning asset protection attorney um, if they're going to be meeting with one or, or they have one and they just want to say, do, 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 is who I have um, really thinking about this the way I think about it, maybe the way they should be thinking about it. Are there any questions that you would suggest people listening consider asking an estate planning or asset protection attorney? Yeah. So let's talk about clients that are going to meet with a, the attorney for the first time. And then let's talk about clients that might have an existing one. I think that you need, there's no generalists anymore in the law. There really isn't. Um, you want somebody that that concentrates and only does estate planning. Um, you don't want the guy that, that'll do your divorce and your bankruptcy and I'll do your last will and testament. It, it doesn't work well. You'll get a very, very generic plan. Most likely what you'll get is that attorney called his buddy who we went to law school with says, send me a bunch of forms that you use for your clients and he's going to try to do your estate planning for you. There, you, want it, you want somebody that specializes in this stuff. You also want somebody that's going to put an investment into the relationship. They ought to be willing to do a complimentary call with you or meeting, at least spending 60 minutes with you, um, learning about you, learning about your family, learning about your, your, your specific issues. Um, if you immediately go into that meeting and an attorney tells you, this is what you need, he didn't listen to you. He's telling you what you need rather than hearing first your situation and to formulate in their mind what makes it, what's the best result for you? What are the tools we need to put together to accomplish those goals? So you need to have an attorney that's willing to put an investment. One of the things about estate planning, it's also different about other areas of the law is our relationships go on for a long time, right? It's not like I, I represent a client in a litigation matter. As soon as that case is over, we never talk again. As we've talked, estate planning evolves and I take that seriously. I want my, my, my clients, I want to know about them. And I also want them to be educated. That's number two. Your attorney, after hearing about what your situation is, should educate you on what you're doing. It's important to not just understand the what, right? No, you need a will, a trust, a power of attorney document. You need to understand the why. And if that attorney cannot explain the why to you in a way that you understand in common language, then maybe that's not the best, best fit. Um, they should have some sort of credentials behind them uh, in terms of being noticed by peers, um, whether it be published in articles, writing books, uh, serving on uh, councils. I've been a state planning section uh, bar president. It's just one of those things that, that you know, people know how good of a job you do. It's kind of a small estate planning world. So good reputation. Another thing is great is ask people who they've used. And if they've had a good experience with that attorney, that speaks volumes. Um, we really try to make it, and I think that you should look for this as well, a, 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 as seamless as a possible a, a process as possible, but also a really proactive process, meaning the client should be reaching out to you. We know your life is getting in the way of getting this stuff done. So as much as we can, without being an annoyance, we try to follow up and bug you. We haven't heard from you. We sent you the drafts. You really want that proactive planner. And you also want somebody that's in it for the long haul. After you're done signing your estate planning documents, they don't just say, you know, see ya. They help you with that trust funding. They go through your assets with you and, and make sure that those assets get into the trust. So those are some of the big things. And then, of course, personality is a big, big issue. Um, 
there's plenty of, of wonderful estate lawyers throughout the country, but you want to be able to like the person you're working with as well. And some personalities just don't match. Another reason for kind of that interview where, you know, as much as the attorney is learning about you, you need to be able to learn about them. I learn something new almost every day, and it always comes from the team approach, from advisors, accountants, financial advisors, insurance agents that all need to be part of the team because yeah. a person's accountant will oftentimes know much more intimately what a client's financial profile looks like than I will. Yeah. And I don't want to step on that accountant's toes and they shouldn't step on mine. And, and everybody needs to stay in their lane, but they also need to respect the input from each other. Totally. I couldn't yeah. agree more. Yeah. hundred percent. Yep. And that's just it. It's like no ego. Let's just get to the best answer. I don't care who comes up with it. Let's just get the best solution for that person that we're serving. And then lastly, as we wrap up, man, thank you for you know the time, the knowledge that you dropped on us today. How you mentioned a couple books, how would, if someone's listening and they're like, ah, I kind of like what this guy's, uh, how he, how he rolls and what he had to say, how would they learn more about you and just follow up to get more information? Uh, so, uh, yourcowl.com is our website for our firm. And there's information about me on there. The two books are in, are entrusted, uh, building a legacy that last, it was written in 2015. It's on Amazon. It's also on audible. Uh, unfortunately it's my horrible voice reading it for four and a half hours. But I, I, you know, I'm, I read so much during the day that the last thing I want to do is sit down and read a book, but I love books and I get through a lot of them on Audible. Um, in 2018, we wrote a follow-up called Riveted, uh, 44 Values That Changed the World. Now, luckily on that one, it's also on Amazon, but I was able to talk a client of mine that's a, an, Emmy, an Emmy award-winning voice actress into reading that one. And that one's actually pleasant to listen to. So both on Audible, you can both get them book form. That's a great way to, to kind of learn our philosophy on legacy planning. And then um, the best email address, if they want to reach out directly to me, is Team Andrew, which is again, corny, but at Team Andrew at yourcowl.com. But it goes to me my two paralegals, my three assistants, and that way we never miss an email. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thanks again. You know, we should do this again because I know you have a lot to say on all these things from estate planning to asset protection to really legacy planning. And so we'll have you back on if you're open to that. I think the audience would appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we'll wrap up with, look, this is the Way to Wealth Pro uh, podcast where we're all about making money simple, allowing you to truly fully live now catch you on the next episode. The opinions voiced in Way to Wealth with Scott Ford, Managing Director, Partner, and Wealth Advisor of Carson Wealth are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. No strategy assures success or protects against loss. To determine what may be appropriate for you, consult with your attorney, accountant, financial, or tax advisor prior to investing. Guests on Way to Wealth are not affiliated with CWM LLC or Satera Advisor Networks LLC. Carson Wealth, 19833, Leitersburg Pike, Suite 1, Hagerstown, Maryland, 21742.